Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Fiorella Pinillos, and I work here at SFU Van City Office of Community Engagement. Uh, we are pleased to partner with Vancouver Moving Theatre on this event. Before we begin, I would like to take this moment to acknowledge that we are on traditional unceded and occupied territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. I would, <laughs> um, I would also like to thank my co-workers, I'm Andrea and Lucia, for making this event possible. And a special thanks to Kelty McCarker uh, for all her work and dedication with Barrio Flamenco and uh, her students at the Carnegie Center. Yay! <laughs> um, for this event, I would like to ask you not to take pictures or, of, or video. We're actually, we actually have like a, a professional um, video right there, and we will share the link uh, with everyone. Um, now I would like to welcome Terry Hunter, um, one of the co-founders of Vancouver Moving Theater and uh, Heart of the City Festival. <laughs> And before we start, yes. Um, so before we start the movie, I would like to introduce Kelty McCarriker. She's Barrio Flamenco host and producer. And Kelty has studied flamenco dance, singing, and percussion for 10 years with Al Mosaico Flamenco Dance Academy in Vancouver, traveling to New Mexico, Spain, and Spain to immerse in the art form. She started, she started Barrio Flamenco in 2010 to bring two loves together, flamenco and the downtown east side. Thank you, Fiorella. Um, it's such a 
delight and an honor to be invited to, to you know, share this work that's been probably the highlight of my, the highlight of my sort of creative life over the last five years. So, um, I'm so appreciative of all the uh, the Carnegie students that have come out for this, and uh, looking forward to our live performance later, and to seeing the film on the big screen. Um, it's kind of formal, me being behind this podium, and it's funny because you know flamenco doesn't have a very formal history at all. You know, it's a it's a very informal, traditional, community-based art form. And uh, I'm I'm going to talk before we show the film, just to give some context about sort of how this grew, and and then a little bit about the history of flamenco, because you know in the film I I touch on it, but it's really it's it's nice to kind of have a bit more of a context of why. Um, why there's this kind of resonance between the, the art form and, and the community here um, in the downtown east side. So first of all, I just wanted to say that I, I appreciated that Fiorella um, acknowledged the, the unceded territories and the Coast Salish presence um, uh, in, this, in their territory here, and because um, I feel that as artists who are uh, working in an art form and practicing an art form that has a history of struggle, um, a history of sort of people's struggles and uh, oppression, that it's important to acknowledge the place, you know, those struggles in the place that we're living. So um, just much gratitude to our hosts, uh, our true hosts on this land. And, um, and, and how, yeah, the, those, those themes of sort of displacement and, um, and home really really show up um, in flamenco's history. So just briefly, um, I, again, as Fiorella mentioned, I, Barrio Flamenco started in 2010, and the photos that you're seeing are from uh, its first location, which is Rada Eatery and Yoga Studio, uh, which is above the Brick House on Main Street. And it was such a fun event. And, and Terry and, and Savannah from Vancouver Moving Theatre and the Heart of the City Festival showed up at, at that first event and invited me to produce a similar event for the festival. So that's how that started. And then Carnegie got in touch with me and said, well, why don't you offer flamenco classes? And then that's just been an ongoing relationship. So I really have to thank Heart of the City Festival and Carnegie for continuing to support this work over many years. And just the community's enthusiasm for it is kind of blows me away. It, it developed its own momentum and after a while I just kind of showed up, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, uh, so flamenco is, uh, as I mentioned, a traditional art form that has many different cultural influences and orig originated in southern Spain. Um, it, it really started with the singing, or um, the cante as it's called. So the dance and guitar came later, and what you see performed is, is really something that's developed since um, those, those origins. But the, the, the main cultural influences are the Moorish, or an, an Islamic practicing people from Northern Africa originally, Jewish and Gypsy people. And um, the, the Moors had come to, uh, to Spain in the eighth century and had sort of conquered a lot of that territory and renamed it Al-Andalus. Uh, which became Andalusia later on. Um, and, and Spain was actually a, an important center in the, um, the Islamic world. It was part of the caliphate of Damascus. And um, Cordoba, a city in southern Spain, was a real center for Islamic culture. Some of the most amazing um, examples of Islamic architecture in the world are in Spain. And uh, it was known as a center for music. So very famous musicians traveled from the Middle East, from Baghdad to uh, southern Spain, and really influenced the, the musical style and, and the, the kinds of rhythms that you hear. So the rhythms that you hear in flamenco are not your traditional kind of pop four beat that we hear on the radio. They're, they're very uh, complex rhythms in, in sixes and twelves. Um, so you'll, you'll hear a little bit of, of that tonight. Um, and that's one of the things that makes it so difficult to learn flamenco is, is mastering those new rhythms that your body isn't accustomed to. Um, so uh, under the, the Moorish rule in Andalusia, there was actually a, a quite a freedom of religion. Obviously, you know, there was enormous gaps between rich and poor as there are in most societies. But um, 
there was actually a very highly developed society there in comparison with the rest of Europe at the time, you know, like even to the point of caring for the mentally ill and, and having like a lot of public work. So it was a, um, the Jewish and the Islamic and Christian faiths were kind of all practiced by people. Um, and, um, and then later on, as we'll see, that, that really changed. Um, and then the other important influence to discuss is the, the gypsy influence, of course, because flamenco is known as a, uh, an art form of the gypsies, um, or the Roma people. Um, and so the, the Roma were, are believed to have originated in India and have migrated throughout Europe um, and arriving in Spain you know, sometime in the 15th century and were welcomed at first and because they were, faced a lot of persecution throughout Europe, but were... Uh, welcomed at first in Spain, so really settle, set a, or established a presence there. Um, and then, but then of course that also changed with um, when Spain was reconquered by the, the Christian regime or the Christian forces um, in 1492, which is a, a notorious year for other reasons, um, uh, the year that Columbus sailed, you know, and actually, interestingly enough, um, that document uh, providing the funding and the ships for Columbus to make that journey was, happened in Granada, in a city in southern Spain, by the new Catholic kings. So um, there's kind of an interesting connection there. So, um, so 1492, the kingdom of Granada was conquered and, and all of Spain was now under Christian rule. And um, there was a lot of changes that started to, to happen. Um, so anti-gypsy laws started to be passed um, and the laws got progressively more brutal and restrictive over the next several centuries. Um, so families were broken up and people taken as slaves and just a lot of that, um, you know, pro prohibited from practicing traditional dance and music and speaking their own language, um, which is Calo, gypsy language um, in Spain. And so the, the gypsy barrios, so barrio is a word meaning neighborhood, really became places of refuge, not only for gypsies, but for many people that were facing persecution at that time. And then in, um, in the early 1500s, uh, all citizens of the new Spain were declared Roman Catholics. So that meant, of course, that if you practice Islam or, or Judaism, that you were forced to convert under, you know, on pain of death. And, and a lot of people did convert in name to try to avoid persecution, but eventually a lot of the um, the Moriscos, as they were known, or the, the Moors who'd converted to Christianity, were eventually exiled anyway. Um, and so th there's a lot of stories. I mean, a lot of this is, is kind of coming from the realm of story and legend because there's a lot that we don't know about flamenco's history, of course. Um, you know, there aren't the records, but there's a lot of piecing together. But there's a field called flamencology that has actually developed because people are so interested in this history. Um, and so a lot of those, those Moorish people took refuge in, um, we believe, in the, the gypsy barrios. So especially around the areas where flamenco is said to be born, around the, the Guadalquivir River, where uh, Seville and um, Jere and Cadiz, some of the main hearts of, of where flamenco comes from are. Um, so all of, this, all of this kind of cultural inter interchange and, and the different intersecting oppressions really sets the stage for flamenco to, to develop later in the, um, the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and, you know, as mentioned, a lot of people think of flamenco as a primarily gypsy art form, um, but, you know, some scholars have argued that it kind of romanticizes flamenco to, to think of it as the sort of music of the gypsies and, and to really look at sort of the different political realities and the fact that there was a lot of different kinds of people, um, ethnic and socioeconomic oppressions that were happening. So um, in these gypsy barrios, like the poorest neighborhoods of the, of the cities, um, there were, you know, many people would, would take refuge there, like runaway slaves and, um, you know, all the blind outlaws, like all of the sort of outcasts of society or people who were, who were not sort of held up within the, the prevailing system of the time. Um, flamenco culture at that time was intimately connected with the sex trade and with the drug and alcohol culture. So, you know, it definitely has like a very sort of dark and underground history that way. And, um, you know, one scholar calls it a flamenco ethnicity that developed. So it wasn't one particular cultural group, but there was almost an ethnicity around flamenco that developed that was a, really centered around 
uh, taking pride in being an outcast in a way. So rejecting the, um, the aristocratic kind of um, impositions of the, the upper classes and, um, and having sort of a, an outsider status. So um, there's, there's, and also, I mean, really, like if you've been in a flamenco or a traditional flamenco uh, huerga or a party, it's very intimate. It's very, there's a lot of elements of ritual to it. There's, there's a lot of um, an opportunity to, to share in, in suffering together and, um, and then to transform it and to, to play with it and to, to have a lot of fun with it. So, so these, all of these themes of, of kind of taking a very difficult situation and, um, and turning it around and celebrating with your community. So uh, these are some of the things that really show up for me in flamenco and why I feel and, and have felt for years that this, there's this connection with, with the neighborhood here in the downtown east side that has these values of resistance and a lot of awareness of social justice and, and oppression. So, um, so at any, at any rate, um, I'll finish up there just by saying that eventually the, um, the gypsy singers gained the, the patronage of the aristocracy and later on, sort of in the 1800s, especially um, foreign travelers to Spain thought that this was a really cool, like sexy kind of sound and wow, what, what is this music? It's so haunting and... And, uh, and the gypsy singers were eventually given jobs and started to perform for some of the richer uh, society. So it was really with that patronage that then the, the gypsy singers, or the gitano singers, began to develop the art form and, and really turn it into something that we can see today that's then taken off to become this international art form. So um, flamenco kind of entered a golden era at that time. And, and then I think from that point forward, it really did become the, the music of the gypsies, like the, the it, very rightly, the cultural heritage of the, the um, Roma people in Spain. So, so um, that's just a, probably too much talking, um, but I am very delighted to um, now kind of introducing um, a later period, uh, uh, the more recent period of flamenco's history, um, a, a very revered maestro in Vancouver, Oscar Nieto, who is uh, my teacher and the teacher of many here tonight, who uh, basically founded the flamenco scene in Vancouver, and uh, very delighted that he's here. So I'm going to invite him up to say a few words about his recent Canada Council sabbatical, um, in, in which he traveled to Spain and did a bunch of research that is quite exciting. So come on up, Oscar. <laughs> Buenas noches. Muchas gracias. Uh, as Kelsey said, I've been on sabbatical and it's been quite an interesting journey to research the current development of flamenco and where it is at today in the 21st century. Um, picking up where she left off in the Café Cantante era of the middle 1800s, that's when flamenco was brought out of the closed home environment into the uh, public environment in the cabarets or cafés cantantes as they were called. Uh, up into the early part of the 20, 20th century. That's when it began to evolve into more Spanish dance and flamenco dance. A lot of people confuse the two. Spanish dance is uh, related to the other forms of dances from other regions in Spain. And flamenco is usually, as Kelty said, identified with the gitanos or the gypsies. Uh, but there's a, a big mix of uh, influences in, in flamenco. In the early part of the 20th century, the, 20, the 1920s, 30s, uh, a, a push forward to bring it onto the bigger stage was created in, in what was called the Opera Flamenco, which uh, brought it onto the concert stage with orchestras and so forth. And a lot of people at that time thought it was being diluted. But now, in retrospect, a lot of those old singers of, from that area are being uh, studied again and have been kind of resurrected. Uh, and that uh, style has been given a lot of credit for spreading flamenco to the wider uh, community and, in fact, to the world. Uh, I'm just going to read a little bit fr uh, from uh, the introduction of a book that I've been working on. Uh, it's, um, it's about the history of flamenco and more uh, current events in flamenco. So uh, this is what I have written as part of my introduction. 
Over a period of 16 years, I've, I have conducted many hours of interviews with dancers, teachers, singers, artists, choreographers, aficionados, enthusiasts, and historians, both gypsy and non-gypsy. In this art form, conformity of opinion is not always guaranteed. There were times when, despite their authority, interviewees gave different answers to the same questions. This may be because flamenco has historically been an oral tradition, usually passed on unwritten from one family member to another. Often, this was because illiteracy, especially amongst gypsies, made it impossible for them to write down what they knew. For this reason, my personal conclusion is that for some questions, there may never be agreement or definitive answers. As one gypsy interviewee told me, I was taught to create our own story and stick to it. Even among books much more exhaustive than this one, there is disagreement. The best I can offer are conclusions based on these interviews, my personal experience as a flamenco artist, and comparative research over a period of more than 40 years. I had the privilege of working with many of my era's top artists and innovators, Antonio Gades, Jose Antonio of Ballet Siluetas, and former artistic director of the Ballet Nacional de España, Ciro, Jose Greco, and Lola Montes, to name a few. It was also my good fortune to be mentored by Lola Montes and to work with her for a period of 30 years. She was the first American dancer to work with the legendary Carmen Amaya. She also danced with and married one of the innovators of Spanish dance in the early part of the 20th century, Antonio Triana. Some of the choreographies that Antonio created were passed on to me and then to other dancers through my work with her company. I was fortunate to interview Antonio Triana's daughter, Luisa Triana, who is 82 years old and now lives in, in Sevilla, Spain. She is renowned for her painting. It was a fascinating interview because she was one of the few people still alive that was there at, at the apex of the, um, the, 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 a lot of the Spaniards, the artists, top artists that traveled from Spain during the Spanish Civil War and made their careers in North America. She was only a little girl, so she got to witness uh, quite an extraordinary period in the history of Spanish dance. And she is optimistic. So a lot of the questions, some of the questions that I asked the interview, the people whom I interviewed was, what is the state and where is flamenco today in the 21st century? She is one of the, uh, one of the people who believes that there is a, she's optimistic that flamenco will survive, but it will go back to a full circle. It will go back to some of the traditional forms because like any art form, it can only go so far with innovation before it has to change or it has to move. Some of the other people whom I interviewed were less optimistic. Uh, some believe that flamenco may in fact become kind of a cult uh, uh, because not a lot of people, especially the younger people in Spain, are that interested in flamenco. Uh, I went to some of the peñas, the flamenco clubs in Jerez, Spain, and there weren't a lot of people, young people, attending these very valuable venues for flamenco. And this is primarily where you go to listen to flamenco cante. A little dance and music, certainly, but primarily it's a venue for listening and appreciation of the cante or the song forms. As Kelty said, that is the basis of flamenco. And so where, where is it being developed? Well, one of the places where it used to be uh, kind of a melting pot or a, uh, a, an area where it was uh, developed by the community were in the bars. What did people do, especially men in pre-television era? Uh, they'd go to the local bar and hang out and talk and talk about sports and talk about cante start a little Palma session with Cante and maybe somebody would get up and dance. And this is where it was kind of kept alive and created. Nowadays, unfortunately, because of uh, the situation in the local bars where you have big screen TVs that are constantly showing sports events, this interferes with the cultivation of flamenco art. In fact, a lot of bar owners don't want flamencos 
uh, hanging out in the bars, disrupting the other clientele. So this is, can be problematic. The other thing is the infusion or development of Western art and music into the, the, the fabric of flamenco. A lot of the younger choreographers now are not sticking strictly to Spanish dance, but they have incorporated elements of hip hop, popping, and in some cases, some of the singers, Tomasito for one, has incorporated rapping and that kind of style into his flamenco cante. Uh, jazz, Paco de Lucia was one of the big innovators that introduced jazz harmonies and other percussive instruments into the art of flamenco. So there's been a whole shift in terms of where flamenco has gone. The other thing that some of the gypsies that I interviewed uh, in Jerez told me is that they no longer sing about donkeys and caravans and their, their struggle for life because they have been integrated into the bigger fabric of Spanish culture. One uh, very famous uh, pop flamenco artist who's Gitano says he writes about McDonald's, VWs, and the current situation in Spain. That's, that's a fact. It's, it's, so it's changing. Uh, a lot of them, the, the pain that they used to sing about, the I as we call it, the llanto or the cry, was for, uh, uh, to seek uh, solace from the oppression and uh, the discrimination. Well, that is also changing. As gitanos become more affluent, they don't have the reason for the I. Uh, so it, the, the core of flamenco, which was the pain and the, the the cry for justice has kind of shifted. That is going to influence the future of flamenco and uh, thankfully it is being kept alive in areas you'd be surprised such as this in Vancouver where flamenco is considered an interesting, very interesting art form and I'm very happy to be part of this community that may in fact help to keep flamenco alive for a bit longer and, uh, and spread to the rest of the world. It goes back and forth. The Spaniards in Spain want to come here to work because of the, what they kept calling the, the crisis, la crisis, the economic crisis in Europe. So they're finding, trying to find ways to come over here to make money because it's not that easy in Spain. But my experience in Spain was very gratifying in terms of the research that I did. And fortunately, I, I was still able to talk to some of these people who have uh, rich histories still to, to discuss and to share with people like myself. So I'm happy to share that with you and on to the performance of this evening. Muchas gracias. So there you have it, right from the horse's mouth. <laughs> Thank you, Oscar. Uh, so yeah, we'll have the film next. Flamenco really is an outsider art form. I mean, flamenco really evolved from the tavern, from people's living rooms, um, from the street, you know, the people who had nothing, and the um, barrios, or the neighborhoods around the cities in southern Spain where the gypsies lived and, and the, you know, outcasts of society kind of congregated and, and, and found a place, you know, on the margins. So there was a real resonance to me between some of the, those qualities in the downtown east side, the, the passion, the sense of resistance, the sense of um, cultural pride, and, and also the, the acceptance of many different people who, for one reason or another, have found a home here in what is some ways, in some ways a community of outsiders in the downtown east side. Kelty McCarricker has put together this wonderful class at Carnegie Center where it has attracted the most mixed group of people who all come together because 
We liked the idea of dancing to flamenco. We all liked listening to it, but we all had some urge in us to find out more about the music, but also to get some sense of how that dance happens. It's really compelling when you see it on stage or on a film. But the thought that we could just come here and actually learn it, and I wasn't expected to, you know, be judged on what I was doing, was an incredible opportunity. students who has been with me here at Carnegie Community Center studying flamenco for almost five years now and their commitment and dedication to learning this art form to understanding the culture of it to even so far as learning the singing they've really embraced it wholeheartedly and then beyond that at the Barrio Flamenco events with the Heart of the City Festival some of them are at a point where they're able to get up on stage and actually be performing with the professional dancers that that come so it's it's a very special and unique mix of some of the best professional flamenco dancers and singers and guitarists in the city and then community members who have learned these forms and can actually get up and dance with them and do palmas with them and all of the the artists are so appreciative and so amazed at, at what an uh, enthusiastic audience it is. You know, it's just so much fun to perform in this, in this community, in this neighborhood, because of the, the receptiveness. And the whole audience is shouting, ole, and uh, really getting into it, and even jumping up on stage at whatever opportunity. So that's what flamenco is really about, participation that way. So. For some reason, people in this community really um, understand what is being transmitted through flamenco. I mean, there's a lot of themes of, of pride, of moving through suffering, of sort of like the phoenix to the ashes, which is the, the symbol of the Heart of the City Festival, embracing you know, the difficulty of life and, and finding community through that and expressing it. You know, life has a very mixed character and flamenco has a very mixed character. There's a lot of joy and a lot of pain. There's a lot of laughter and a lot of grief. And um, that makes sense here in this, in this community with everything this community has gone through. You know, I know that for myself, it was very important to find a strong community that created music together and created rhythm and that I could share in. And I really wanted to bring that to, to this community too.
I'm, I mean, I think it really speaks for itself, but it's just such a joy to have all of you here to share it, and many of the people who are in that film are here tonight, so thank you sincerely to all of you. Uh, I have to say a quick word um, about Colin Askey, the filmmaker who has um, broken his leg and is getting surgery as we speak. So let's just send out some love to Colin because he even learned flamenco in order to make this film. Like he's <laughs> there doing the arms. So thank you, Colin. And he made this amazing image, uh, which is um, taken and kind of posterized a photograph by this famous photographer, Rupen Afanador, who, who took these incredible photographs of these most famous flamenco artists in these really kind of weird costumes and provocative, like it's amazing the access that he got to these people. This is um, Mathilde Coral, who's one of the legends of flamenco. So it's kind of amazing that she's here representing this event. So, <laughs> ole. <laughs> So I have the great pleasure now of uh, leading into the moment you've all been waiting for, which is our live performance of the evening. And I'd like to invite our artists to the stage. We have our guitarist, Peter Mohl, <laughs> who's um, our singer, Jaffeline Helton, and uh, our two dancers, Michelle Harding and Andrea Williams. Ole. And there will, there will be a talk back after the performance, so if you have any questions that you're burning on, just uh, hold on to them. Oh, yeah, Carnegie Flamencos, are you ready? Maestro Oscar. You should be singing, so yeah. Mira la cara, cara que la primera. 
I'm just going to quickly, oh, sorry, oh, I'm surprising the sound people. <laughs> I just want to quickly say that that was Sevillanas, which is a folk dance from Sevilla. And uh, we've been studying that for a while. And we don't do classes like all year. We do kind of workshops twice a year. And so the fact that they've just danced all four of those, some of them, is amazing. So you guys rock. Thank you. Um, so we had Ellie, Brian, Mila, Marty, uh, Stephen, and Anne dancing, I think. Yay! Who else danced? Put up your hand if you danced. Yeah. And Leah. Oh, Leah. Leah. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's welcome uh, to say ole or shout ole or any other kind of haleos when you see that the dancer is doing or something exciting. So you're 
going, ole, or vale, agua, vamos allá, mira, toma que toma. <laughs> Too many, right? But that's the way, but with strength and fuerza. So you are welcome to do that now if you get all excited. <laughs> We are, we are going to do solo singing now. Oh no, solo dance, right? Whatever you want. Solo one, it says solo one. Okay.
André. style called Guajiras. Sweet.
been singing for a long time, the whole week, so in other projects, so I was a little bit scared about tonight. <laughs> no está mal, maestro se no está mal y pico no está mal. Ole, so happy to see Oscar back. I always, we always get, we protect him a lot. We love him so much. Every time he goes away, we we want him back here so that he stays safe and. But he seems to be very happy. <laughs> Coming back, uh, recharge all the batteries here. Thank you.
hasta aquí y está en la guerra de Francia hay buscando con un Limona me conoce por los suspiros. Ay, muchacha. Y ay, qué buen caminito. Ay, cuidadito.
Gracias, guapa.
plástico blanco primo me lo pongo yo
Gracias. Thank you so much, everyone. So that was, uh, that was Peter Mole, Jocelyn Helton, uh, Michelle Harding, and Andrea Williams. Ole. So there's a word in flamenco called coraje, which means courage. And it comes from the word for heart. So uh, I would say that that performance had a lot of coraje. Ole. Jocelyn has to run away because she's got another gig to go to. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a really a pleasure to be here and to sing for you all and for these people from the Carnegie Hall. So thank you so much. Happy to see you again. Thank you. Um, we do have a, a time for question and answers right now. And um, the artists are going to stay on stage. And actually, I'd like to invite any of the uh, participants um, who dance Savianas with us to also come sit up here if you'd like to also answer any questions. Um, and there's a couple of people that I just need to thank before we, people start trickling out, which is, uh, <laughs> I, I really want to thank Fiorella with SFU Yay, and SFU Office of Community Engagement. Thank you so much. She really brought this to me and was like, let's do something. So. Um, and then I also just want to acknowledge that um, some of the photography that you saw uh, at the beginning of the evening was um, by Elvira Yeves, uh, so our resident flamenco photographer. <laughs> and of course, I wouldn't even be speaking to you right now if we didn't have this wonderful sound. So uh, is, it, is it Rodney? Yeah, thank you very much, Rodney. Okay, so who, where are there are there microphones for people who want to ask questions? Yeah, or just we can hear. Just yell. Where are you? Hello, you hoo I like my own voice. Um, I was noticing that when you stopped, like uh, when you're slowing down the flamenco, uh, the guitarist, like he stopped and he was like watching you to see what the heck you're gonna do next. Was this like, oh, were you? Yeah, you know, you gotta answer this, ha <laughs> um, So I, I was wondering, were you like waiting to see what direction she was going in before you would play? The, the, uh, the one who did the longest. And then, and then you, and then you knew what to play because, because of what she was doing. Yeah. Um, actually we all sort of know the rhythm so well. I can, we can all stop and we're sort of counting in our heads and we mm. know that I know that she, I know she has lots of tricks. I was waiting to see what her next trick was and, uh. and I've seen it. So I know what she's going to do with one of them, but if I wait, <laughs> I know I'll look, like, I'll look good like I'm playing property instead of playing something else. So I wait for her to do something and then I can react. And we're, like we all, we've done it enough where we know the time. And like you said, we've got it in our head, so we just wait. And then that, you know, the 12 or the 10 will come up or the three that we want and then we'll sort of join in. So, can, yeah. can you tell what she's going to do by the movement of her hands, by the movement of her body? Well, yeah, like I said, she has lots of different things. They, everyone builds up an inventory of things they can do. 
And then if I, as soon as I recognize it, oh, she's doing that again, eh? Okay. <laughs> oh, that <laughs> and that <way>. thing. <laughs> I can do that. No, that, yeah, just waiting. I mean, it, it, that's the whole improvising, the fun about it. It's, it's just getting, you know, you know what's coming up. You don't know what's coming up, but you can, um, you know you can play something, but you have to, you have to react very quickly, and then you get it. It's kind of, it's fun. Actually, I was having a lot of fun tonight. It's good. Okay. <laughs> and I'd yeah, also like... I'd like to commend these three ladies here because they're just wearing jeans and they were up there dancing. Yeah. Some of them oh, have some, uh, <laughs> some pretty fancy footwear. You're all three different footwear, so it was just like, woo, pretty cool. And Kelty with her flats. You know, like you could all be dancing and doesn't matter what kind of footwear you guys got. And it's just like, you guys are just so awesome. I just find myself, you know, forget about Hole. I just laugh or I, whatever. But anyhow, you guys bring so much joy to me. Thank you. We like questions. We have a question. Please play another song. <laughs> <laughs> Please play another song. That's a good question. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, a question for Kelty. I was just wondering, um, did you face any challenges um, with your barrio flamenco? Um, anything from finding the space or you know, gathering people or encouraging them, to, them to, to come out of their shell and try something different? Hmm. That's a good question. Thanks, Charlene. <laughs> um, challenges. Well. I mean, the, the mandate of the classes at Carnegie are to be really open to anyone. And um, they started out as, you know, introductory classes to flamenco. And then, and then the same people kept coming back year after year. And then it was like, okay, well now we have a, a beginner class and then we have an intermediate class. And, and yet there's, it's the mandate of the classes is still to be open to everyone. So, it's a really amazing, very unique environment at Carnegie um, because uh, there's a mix of people from different levels. People who've been studying flamenco for five years and people who just come to kind of drop in. So my challenge is to create an environment that everybody gets something out of the experience. And um, it's been, I, what I found is really amazing is that um, some of the, the um, kind of the, the old hat uh, folks, <laughs> sorry, can I call you that? But the folks who are, who are, you know, just so um, like it's just amazing that you've come and been so dedicated to this. I mean, there's obviously a fire burning in you to learn this art form, and I'm so honored that I get to, you know, do that with you. But, um, you know, you have really helped me to to create a more welcoming community and a more rich community because you you help to to teach the new people. So I don't have to work so hard, and now the new people learn the dances in half or less than half the time that it took me to teach them to you. Because you know, so the, and and also with the rhythms, like we sit around doing palmas, and and everyone picks it up so much faster when there's more people in the room that kind of have that um, in their bodies. So yeah, I would say that's the biggest challenge, but also the biggest kind of a reward. Uh, Kelty, uh, not so much questions as maybe the the dialogue. And first of all, uh, you know, thank you for letting all of us be part of your life, where you're talking about the highlights. So, you know, for everyone here that, you know, that we're part of each other's life, and thanks for letting us be part of the community. But I'm thinking, uh, especially because uh, Colin had other <laughs> places to be, um, is this the premiere of his film? And maybe can you talk a little bit about that? Because I feel like, you know, this is like premiere night. Right. And that there's a whole like support, you know, to go with that and a whole spirit. Um, well, the, this, I think this, this film actually screened for the first time at uh, Vancouver Moving Theatres AGM. Um, but this is definitely the first time it's been yeah, screened. Yeah, I mean, we'll call the this the public one. The because, public yeah. screening, yeah. Um, Oh, I don't know what to say. I mean, it was just so wonderful to have Colin there. It was a little bit scary. Um, I mean, introducing film into any community that is like, where we've developed relationships of trust and it's kind of vulnerable to be like, okay, now can I bring a camera in and film you learning to dance? I mean, 
I, I definitely felt very hesitant about it and, and I, I took a lot of cues from the, the people who were sort of the stars of the film, like what, you know, what, make, what would make you comfortable and, and Colin was great, I think. I mean, I don't know, do you want to answer that, anyone? Mila, do you want to say something? Well, you know, one thing I, I was going to say, we were talking about Peter. <laughs> that says it all. <laughs> yeah, this. Ole! <laughs> I would like to ask the one who's dancing a lot. Did you have like a Red Bull or something? Like a Red Bull? Cause you, cause we were talking, just whispering. It was just like she's not even breaking a sweat. Oh yeah, I broke a sweat. I don't know. It's kind of like a drug. Flamenco is like a drug. Flamenco is Red Bull. It is like it is Red Bull itself. Like you just kind of get going and you get kind of you ride on it. Toro. <laughs> Toro Rojo. <laughs> <laughs> we actually kind of joke about that a little bit because it is almost addictive. Like, um, for me, I, I, I get, like, I don't know, maybe it's like body chemistry or something. You get, I get so sort of excited, I get so, like, thrilled by dancing that I, I can't get enough. Like, I just, like, I don't get tired. I just keep going. It's almost spiritual, too. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's kind of cool. Your calves after? <laughs> My calves don't bother me. Your feet? Mm, little Epsom salts. <laughs> oh, there's another question. Well, thank you. Gracias. Hermoso, as usual, beautiful. Um, Kayling, I have a question. Uh, we talk uh, at some point. You were t um, mentioning. Um, the importance of doing this type of uh, dancing in the downtown east side. Um, I arrived a little late, I was in a different place, but um, I don't know if that was uh, acknowledged in the movie or if you can talk a little bit about uh, that, that strength and that resistance uh, that, that is created with this uh, music, with this dancing. If you could talk a little bit about that. And sure. thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, that we did, I feel we did kind of discuss that, um, and that was reflected in the film. Um, and then just kind of, I think the history of flamenco kind of speaks for itself as well. But I mean, I, I have to say that I didn't necessarily come in to this community with that agenda. And I think that's really, you know, well, I, I kind of have to check myself around that because it's, I mean, I'm sort of, I, I like to think I'm sort of an honorary member of this community, but I'm not, like, it's not really my hood in the same way that it is people who live here, right? So, so it's like, well, what is the importance of flamenco in the downtown east side? I mean, I've, I've kind of been more interested in what other people have to say about that. Um, and I've, I think that my sort of more nuanced understanding of why those connections are working and why there's such enthusiasm and receptiveness has developed over time just through my conversations with people and feedback from the audience um, at Barrio Flamenco. So, you know, I, I mean, I've learned a lot about flamenco from this community, actually. I really have. So it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, does anyone have any comments about that from the classes or, you know, just uh, from that, from a different perspective than me? Like... Uh, yeah, I, I live um, further east of the downtown east side, and uh, it's like kind of an honorary member. But when I when I really feel it, like that that it really is barrio flamenco, is when um, especially when we did them in the Carnegie Center when we had the the heart of the city. Um, Night, nights when we did flamenco. And there were a lot of people like from, you know, from the neighborhood and some from further away. And that, that just felt really focused and concentrated as a, as a, a barrio in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when I felt it the most strongly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's addictive. 
And it's, and it's addictive. <laughs> I've got a, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, Michelle, you were talking about flamenco as a drug, you just get up there and you go. And Andrea as well. Kelty is doing this thesis on Duende. <laughs> so, I mean, would you call what you're, would you call that Duende? I mean, it sounds to yeah, me. Yeah, what is Duende? Yeah, whatever um, Duende is. <laughs> it's, I'm gonna let Kelty talk more about what Duende is, because I'm not sure I really 100% know <laughs> but what I do know is that flamenco can take you out of your body. It can take you out of your world, whatever your daily life is, whatever is bothering you. It's, it's almost a meditation. It can take you completely out of your body and you just become spirit and you just enjoy it. Like, that's it. And that's all there is. You don't have to worry about mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether that's what Duende is, but it sure is great. <laughs> well, I, I just like to point out that from the perspective of somebody who's sitting behind Michelle when she's dancing, I'm pretty sure that that's Duende when she's up there. I mean, you guys all felt it. I heard it. I heard you feel it. So um, most of you might not know that Michelle has had one of the most horrible days ever today. <laughs> what happened? Horrible stuff. You don't want to know. But you couldn't tell that from her dancing, right? It literally did exactly what she said. It took her away. Um, and you can actually feel it come off her when she dances. It's amazing. It's amazing. So from like one meter away, you can feel it and probably 30 meters away, you can feel it. So that, for me, is the most physical aspect of Duende. Kelty's thesis is a little bit more cerebral, so I'll let her talk about that. <laughs> I think you've already said it all. Duende, for those who don't know, Duende literally means spirit. So it's, it's, known, in, um, it's known in sort of flamenco literature as this uh, being, literally a different being that enters the space and comes in to the performer um, and also the, you know, whoever is watching. So for me, it's something that really unites, uh, unites people. And, and it's, again, it's that like kind of going beyond your, your sense of self to be really connected with a larger something. Um, so it's no wonder you can't talk about it because it's, it's ineffable. You know, there's no way to talk about it. So yeah, my thesis is, you know, hope somebody is filming tonight so I can just submit that. <laughs> so can we say that it's like a ghost? Yeah, well? I think uh, they would in say a, in Spain yeah. that they would. <laughs> okay. Uh, when is your next performance? Ah, ooh. Well, uh -huh. I'm sure you, these people might be actually performing before I am next, but um, if anyone's interested in dropping into our Carnegie classes to see what we're up to, uh, Saturdays at 2 o'clock um, for the next month, we're going to be at Carnegie in the theatre. So come on down. Um, we're going to be, now that we've nailed all the, the Sevillanas, we're going to work on... Uh, going to keep it on working on Bulerias por Fiesta, which was the last dance you saw here, which is really like I would call the heart and soul of flamenco, and um, it's improvised. So it's really learning how to improvise. And anyways, but any f shows coming up? Anyone? Well, Peter plays all the time. Um, yeah. I'm sure he'll be yeah. playing tomorrow night at the Kino yeah. Cafe on Canby Street. Um, actually, you can probably catch most of us there at some time or another. Um, and that's a, that's a restaurant. Um, I don't know that we have any sort of like, you know, open gigs coming up right away, but keep your eyes out for the summer because there's always festivals and we usually end up in like at the Chinatown Festival, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, come on down. <laughs> Okay, last question. Okay. <laughs> okay, I was wondering about the woman with the shawl. Was that more like um, on the Spanish? Like it's almost like, you know, like you were doing the bowl thing or? 
you know, like, or whatever, like, when you yeah. it off? That's a really good question, actually. Um, I'll summarize it quickly. This, um, this is called a manton, and um, they were originally made in Manila. Uh, they're called manton de manilla, um, and they are a traditional part of the flamenco repertoire. You often see them uh, more in the in the Sevillan tradition of flamenco as opposed to the barrio in Jerez style of flamenco. So it's a different flavor. Um, and we just kind of said, hey, let's give it a whirl tonight. It'll, you know, it's fun. I like playing with this. So boom, we just tried it out. Kelty was asking if it's more classico. I would say not so much, but the Castanuelas that you saw us play in the very, very first piece, that would be more classico. And I think Oscar can actually speak more to that. So if you guys have questions for all of us, we're happy to hang around and just answer a couple questions more after this is over. Great, thank you. So thanks everyone for staying, those of you who stayed, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Fiorella. Come here. Olay.